Greetings and welcome. I'm Dr. Mark Pittstick, your host for Ask the Soul Doctors on HealthyLife.net Radio. After working with many thousands of people over the last 40 years, I've assembled sensible, evidence-based answers to the most commonly asked questions about life, death, and afterlife. And each month on this show, I interview experts on consciousness topics to share their answers. We don't claim to have all the answers or the only answers, but we do have some very good answers that have helped many people make more sense of their life experience. And with us today to help answer these existential questions is Anita Morjani. Anita is the New York Times best-selling author of the book, Dying to Be Me. Her remarkable near-death experience and subsequent healing from end-stage cancer is one of the most amazing medical cases ever recorded. Doctors had given her mere hours to live when she arrived at a hospital in a coma in 2006. But while near death, Anita entered another dimension where she experienced great clarity and understanding about her life and purpose here on Earth. She was given a choice to return to Earth or continue on into another dimension. Luckily for us, Anita chose to return to Earth after she realized that heaven is a state, not a place. Her inner transformation resulted in a remarkable and complete recovery of her health within days of her return. Anita, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for for having me and for that beautiful introduction, Mark. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Given your amazing experience, uh, what you understood before uh, your NDE and then what you've learned after, our listeners and I are looking forward to hearing your answers to the most commonly asked spiritual questions. So let's get started. One of the first, as you know, uh, people ask, who am I? And what can you share with us about that, please? Okay, first of all, I would want people to know that who you are is much more and much greater than this physical body. Most of us are conditioned to feel that all we are is this physical body, and we are limited to the capability and capacity of what our physical body can do and be. And most of our upbringing, our training, our education is focused very much on the physical reality and is dependent on what we can see, hear, feel touch, um, but whereas in actuality there's a whole other dimension which is not brought to our attention and in many cases is even laughed at or poo-pooed at if we do have experiences where we touch this reality. In actuality, what I now know is that we are so much more than this physical body. Um, I'm going to call it consciousness, but we can call it what we want, spirit, soul. It doesn't really matter. It's all semantics. We can even call it God. But who we really are is something that is pure consciousness or God or soul, and it is much bigger than our bodies, more powerful, and when, and if we are able to realize that, the other thing is um, when we can sense ourselves at our consciousness level, we realize or I realize that my consciousness or soul or spirit is connected to yours and it's connected to everyone else. Um, there's no separation. Our bodies make, lead us to believe that we are separate. But in actuality, beyond our bodies, when we can actually get in touch with who we really are, we realize that we're all connected. We're all expressions of the same consciousness, but we're all different expressions expressing ourselves in physical bodies. And when I became aware of this truth of who I really am, I realized that that was the truth, not the physical body. That is who I am, and when I realized it, and when I knew it with every cell of my body, that I am so much greater, I am one with everything, I am one with God, I realized that my body was just a reflection of my realization of that state, and as soon as I realized that state, that's how my body healed. And so I would want people to know that you are much more powerful, amazing, magnificent than you have been led to believe that you are. The second question then uh, that leads from this, all right, if we're beings of consciousness, if we're part of God, uh, why are we here? Why would we come to a place like Earth? 
believe it or not, we choose it. We actually choose it. And and um, I know many people are probably thinking, why would I choose to come here when I could be in that amazing space? We choose it for the experience because um, I like to kid around and say I came here for the chocolate because there's no chocolate in the other realm. But in actuality, because it's in this realm that we have a physical body, and we get to experience certain things like even tasting food, even uh, making passionate love. Physical feelings and physical things are experienced here in a physical body, and we can't experience them in that level. Even though in that level what we feel is amazing and expansive and we feel unconditional love all the time, over here, we get to actually experience and figure out who we truly are. We get to experience challenges, and 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 the idea is what I what I believe, what I experience is that heaven is a state and not a place. And for me, I felt I wanted to test that and come here and experience that state here because I believe that as long as we know who we truly are, it doesn't matter whether I'm there or whether I'm here. I can experience heaven right here with a physical body. Hmm. Let me ask you, um, eight years now since you're NDE or nearly so, the... Um has there been a drop-off for you in this ecstasy or this clarity of remembering who and what you are? Not at all, because um, it changes you. It changed me at the very core, and and I could never go back to the person I was before, ever. And my life has changed so dramatically. There are moments where I um, where I feel where I face challenges where. Um, I feel that, oh, wow, this is, this is really challenging. And I'll tell you exactly what it is. My biggest challenge is when it comes to dealing with other people. And it's because um, people are not ready, not all people, uh, a lot of them are, but not all people are ready to accept this truth of who we really are and how we are so much more and more powerful. Many people are not willing to accept that. And when I am surrounded by people who are not willing to accept it, who are skeptical, who make me feel that I'm being unrealistic or delusional, that is when I face my biggest challenges because sometimes I get caught up in trying to dance for the critics instead of living my life of heaven. And the more I try to please the critics, the more I start to lose myself because I find myself starting to do the things um, that, in other words, they, they sort of hold the, the puppet strings and I start to dance to their tune to, to deliver what they want instead of continuing to live my life and create my reality in the way I know how. And that is the biggest area of challenge that I have found and I can understand why people have, uh, why people do fall into that because it's almost like I'm constantly dancing between fitting in with other people or being bold enough to create my own path and dance to the tune of my own drummer. Sure. Yeah, it's been compared to uh, like walking on a razor's edge, that is being in the world but not solely of the world. Well, uh, yeah. this is great. How about... Um, for number three question, people ask, well, what happens after I die, and, and what are the possibilities? In other words, is there a spectrum of what afterlife is like, depending on how a person was at their time of passing? Okay, I'm going to offer um, my opinion, which stems from my own experience of dying. I believe that in the, uh, in the finality, like in the end, all of us, go to a place of absolute unconditional love. Um, but I think that that there, there have been people who have experienced, for example, hellish NDEs or different levels. I believe that at the time of passing, depending on how strong a hold our mind has to our strong, our beliefs uh, of things like conditioning of of hell and of judgment and so on, we will for a short time experience things according to our beliefs, but it's totally dependent on how strong our mind holds on to those beliefs. So I believe that at the point of death, 
we still are um, we still controlled by our minds at least for the first little while but eventually everybody moves on from that point and i do very strongly believe that everyone moves on to this place of absolute unconditional love i don't believe in hell i absolutely do not believe in hell um and i believe that hell has been created by our conditioning and even the people who've had hellish ndes i i respect the truth of their experience and i'm absolutely not um not dismissing their experience as being unreal because i know they felt real fear but i i feel that if they were in the experience long enough they would have come out of it and they would have realized that it was a it was a result of conditioning and we do all go to this amazing amazing space where we feel extreme clarity so not just extreme unconditional love um but extreme clarity of our lives our purpose why we're here why we chose the life that we previously chose what we want to do next and so on we we all will experience that space of extreme clarity we will also meet up with our deceased loved ones we will also be able to watch over our loved ones which who are still in physical bodies beautiful uh, and so what if, could you say a bit about what then in other words if we uh, all go into this unconditional love and after we greet our departed loved ones and so on then what are the the possibilities after that what are some of the the paths that a person can take i believe actually that we can um we we have a choice after that whether we want to come back now here's what where it gets a little bit interesting is that time is very different in the afterlife than it is here in physical life so while we're thinking in terms of what will we do after that after that and and we're thinking in terms of graduations of time like how can we do that for an eternity and won't we get bored so what will we do next in actuality when we're not expressing in our physical body time doesn't exist in a linear fashion it felt when i was in that nde state it felt as though all of time existed simultaneously i was able to see what i um perceived as my past lives i also what i perceived as my future but i was able to see them all all at the same time as though they were existing all at once and it's kind of like uh, the analogy i use or the metaphor i use is that if you can imagine a huge tapestry with a beautiful intricate picture a beautiful beautiful intricate picture but it's a huge huge tapestry and if you were to go real close to the tapestry almost um to the point where your nose is touching the tapestry you can't see the whole picture anymore but you can see the that the tapestry is woven by these let's say these silk threads and so you can see every individual strand of thread so it feels like as though my life is one of those strands of threads and my life is one of those strands and if i was to follow it i would be living my life one point of time at a time um along the line of that strand of thread as it weaves through the tapestry touching other lives that means other threads and um and it keeps going like it may um i may die i may come back again but that thread just keeps going which is say my consciousness but if i was to step back then i can see all the threads which means i can see all my lives at once and i can see the whole picture that it weaves as i touch other people as other people touch other people and so being in that nde state was like i had popped out of my life and i was looking at an overview where i could see the whole thing at the same time what if i was if i was that thread at the time of being that thread expressing one point of a t- uh, time at a time um i can only see my life as linear what's past and and i don't know what's to come but if i pop out of my life it's like i can see the entire path of that thread including what i have not yet experienced and including where it touches everyone else and and who else they touch and who i've touched before and who they've touched and all the other lives 
put together to create this beautiful, perfect tapestry that just makes sense. Well, uh, super energy. I'm really am enjoying this. So uh, you've uh, used uh, the term God, uh, higher power, and so the next question is, what is what is that phenomena like, and what is our relationship to it? Now, this is really interesting. I feel that a lot of our problems are caused because we feel separate from God. We feel God is a separate entity who judges us and um, punishes us, and and so we're constantly thinking in terms of uh, how do I get God to favor me or... Um, or am I going to be judged by God? Where in actuality, when I was in that NDE state, I felt as though I became God or I became one with God. We are all one with God all the time. There is no separation. And it's this belief or feeling of separation that very often causes suffering within us. And many of us are conditioned to um, to believe that we're separate, but also if we say that, no, I'm not separate, I am God, God and I are one, there's no difference between me and God, there's no difference between you and God, we're actually judged for thinking that way. But when in actuality, when I realize, when I look in the mirror and when I realize that it's God reflecting itself behind these eyes through, the, through this body, experiencing itself through this body, when I am able to do that, it becomes easier for me to see God behind your eyes and God behind everybody else's eyes. And if we can learn this, then you would find that crime rate would go down because when people realize that they are God and that everyone else is God, they are less likely to harm other people. And you would find that a lot of suffering goes down as well. Sure. Sure. Well, I think more and more people are um, opening to this idea of our, our oneness. As you know, almost everyone who comes back from their near-death experience says something like, we each are one with the one, we each are yeah. part of source. And so that, that idea is growing, and uh, thank goodness, because as you say, the, the benefits that come from knowing our oneness with source energy are, are huge, and, and thus our ability to transform our lives and our planet. Well, you, um, you referred to suffering a couple of times, and that, of course, is one that comes up very quickly. So, okay, if we're, we're beings of consciousness, if we're one with God, why all the suffering? And, you know, this is especially difficult for people to understand when it, suffering involves a little child being sick or dying at a young age. Yes. Now, first of all, um, there's, I actually have several answers for, for this one or several ways of looking at it, and all of them could apply. And one thing I want to say is that when a little child dies or when anyone dies, it's the people around who are suffering. The child has gone home, and it's. And I believe that we die when it's our time to die. And so, even when a child dies, the child has gone home, and it's. And the child has gone at the perfect time. The child came and presented gifts to all the people that touched that child, and then it's time for the child to go home. And this was something that was most likely determined even before the child came. So there's one so there's one form of what we label as suffering, but in actuality if we viewed it differently, we would uh, we would not see it as suffering. We would be happy for the child to have encountered that time with the child and know that the child is now safe and back home. Um, for children that get ill, again, there's, there's several reasons. One could be that it is part of the plan to get ill, and very often even that illness brings gifts to the people around them. It brings people closer, and there might be a reason that the child has brought the illness with them. And the another type of suffering, though, is what I call the senseless suffering, which we bring upon ourselves. And this is because, a lot of it is because of our conditioning. Our conditioning teaches us that we're separate, that we've got to be more than who we are, that we've got to be better, that we've got to outdo other people. That's a senseless kind of suffering. We become very competitive. We feel we're not good enough, and we destroy our immune systems. So that's the kind of suffering we bring to ourselves, and we have a choice not to do that. Okay, well, I want to share that when I was in that near-death state, 
um, life made sense to me. And I had been suffering up to that point. I had been suffering. I mean, I had always um, made myself small so others could be, feel big. I'd always lived out from a place of fear. I'd been conditioned. I think we live in a culture that is conditioned to fear everything. I, I feared illness. I feared not being good enough. Um, I feared critics. I was always a people pleaser. And so everything I did, every decision I made, I made from a place of fear. And that hugely contributed to my suffering and hugely contributed to my getting cancer. Now, when I was in that near-death state, when I was in that realm, the clarity was so incredible about how I was not supposed to live in fear. I was supposed to make my choices out of love and passion, and I wasn't supposed to be suffering. And what I felt was, why didn't I know this before? Why aren't we taught this? And that's where I realized that most of our suffering comes from being conditioned to believe in uh, the wrong things and to believe and do the wrong things. Um, the biggest thing I learned was that the most important thing I can do is to love and value myself. And I believe the more we love and value ourselves, the less we suffer. A lot of suffering stems from devaluing ourselves and making ourselves small and thinking that we don't matter. Um, another big thing I learned is that I'm supposed to make my choices from a place of love instead of from a place of fear. Like in the past, before my NDE, even if I chose to eat healthy foods, and believe it or not, I was one of those people that was obsessive about being healthy. I used to research um, anti-cancer products and lifestyle. I would take all my supplements. I would drink wheatgrass juice shots. I was vegan. And guess what? I got cancer. And I understood during that near-death state, it was because everything I did in my life, I did from a place of fear. Today, I still choose healthy foods, but I do it not because I fear getting cancer. I'm not obsessive about cancer. I do it because I love my life. I'm passionate about my life. And, and because I consciously choose passion and love and joy, and I do what brings me joy, instead of doing things from a place of fearing the consequences, I don't suffer anymore. Life is so much more pleasant, so much more fun. Uh, question number six that people ask, and there is a certain about order of how often people ask them. Uh, you've already answered the first part, well, I see my departed loved ones again, but uh, the second part, how can people communicate with their departed loved ones now? How can they continue that relationship? Our loved ones are actually around us and guiding us all the time. I feel my father around me all the time. and. Um, and it's actually a lot easier than you think to communicate with them. Um, I would just speak to them as though they're there and just get into a quiet room, spend some time by yourself, but actually you won't be by yourself, and just call on whoever you want to speak to, whether it's a departed, um, a departed spouse or partner or child or parent. Just call on them and speak to them. And in your mind, you can speak to them all the time because when we communicate with our departed loved ones, um, we don't need to, to actually speak full sentences. You can just think about them and think thoughts, and they will know what, what you want them to know. And you don't have to worry about your thoughts being nasty or that you'll be judged or anything. Don't worry at all because your departed loved ones love you unconditionally. And it's very different when we die. And I just want to explain my experience with my father. When I was in the other realm and I met my father, he was without his, without his physical body, and so was I. And I want to say that when I was in physical life with my father, we had a very turbulent relationship. But, uh, but he passed away 10 years before my NDE. And when I met him when, during my NDE in the other realm, I realized that not only is he without his physical body, but he was also without his culture because with our physical body goes our gender, our race, our religion, our culture, our beliefs, and all these filters 
that we have accumulated over a lifetime. And all that was left was pure consciousness, his pure essence. And it was his essence and my essence, and we merged. And today, after, um, after my NDE and, of course, after my father's death, I, I feel I have the most beautiful relationship with my father because I'm encountering his pure essence. And his pure essence is nothing but unconditional love. So even if you have had a bad relationship with someone who's passed away, don't worry about it. Don't hold the guilt. They don't want you to hold on to the guilt. What they want is for you to be happy and find your joy and to free yourself from all that guilt because they are free from it. Because when we are in physical life, we react to each other through all our layers of filters, our cultural filters, our beliefs, our, um, our gender, and so on. Um, but when we die, we lose all of that. And so we actually connect with each other on a pure consciousness level. And that's how your deceased loved ones are connecting with you now. So you can communicate with them freely and just know that they are not holding on to any baggage. So you can let go of any guilt or anything that you're feeling. And if you've lost a spouse or a partner, your partner, your deceased partner will not feel jealous if you meet someone else because nothing will make them happier than for you to be happy again because life is a gift. They know it, and we who are in physical life, we need to know it and make the most of every single day. The next question we want to discuss is, <clears throat> are there really ghosts, evil spirits, and if so, what are they? Okay, my opinion on this is that I don't actually believe that anybody is truly evil. And although I think it's easy to misinterpret, I think it's our own fears here that can misinterpret things and believe that it's evil. Um, I do believe that sometimes we hold on to people, like if somebody's in a coma, um, they can linger, and even their spirit or their consciousness or their soul can linger if we are emotionally attached to them. But I think that once somebody crosses over, I don't believe that there is really any such thing as an evil spirit. I, kn I know I'll probably get challenged on that one um, publicly, but, but I don't believe in any evil spirits as such. I do believe that there are a lot of people who believe strongly and have been conditioned to believe in evil, and I think that our minds interpret certain things as being evil. And same answer for ghosts? Um, same answer for, well, it depends. If it's positive, I actually believe that most of the spirits, at least what I've been feeling um, since my NDE, is that I do feel guided, and these can be um, spirits or deceased loved ones. I feel guided all the time, and they all feel extremely positive to me. So even ghosts, maybe, maybe sometimes our deceased loved ones want to attract our attention in a certain way, so we might see certain things happening that are unexplainable, um, which could be what we call ghost activities. But I, I think the underlying cause, I don't think, is truly evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And so um, what about the, the question, people who have a, a loved one who committed suicide wonders what happens to them, what happens to their soul or life force? Now, usually for somebody to commit suicide, they will do so as a last resort after a lot of suffering on this side. So all they receive when they cross over is pure love and compassion and empathy. That's all. There's no judgment because for someone to even do that, to commit suicide, they are already feeling very lost and lonely, and so they are received with absolutely pure love. So I want to assure the loved ones on this side that your loved one who committed suicide is absolutely not being punished or judged and is not going to... Um, 
get any bad karma or be told that they have to do it all again or anything. They are being received with total compassion and love. And also I want the loved ones on this side, the ones who are alive in the physical world, to know that it's not their fault. A lot of people feel guilty that they didn't see the signs or they weren't there for their loved ones. It is absolutely not your fault. Um, sometimes it happens, you know, no matter how much you are there for someone, people can still feel very alone in their own mind, no matter how much they're surrounded. So people can still feel alone. It's not it's not your fault that this happened, but you can speak to your deceased loved ones at any time. You can speak to them, and they still love you unconditionally. They do not blame you for what happened. Great, great. And what a comfort to those who uh, have had loved ones take their own lives. Makes sense to me. So you've kind of touched upon this when I was prepping for the show and visiting your website, which is beautiful. Uh, you have a, a long interview that you did with someone else and discussed a lot of topics, and I really encourage uh, listeners to visit that. Lots of interesting uh, information. Uh, and so you, you talk some about how can I best uh, get in touch with my essence and how can I know my higher purpose. Now, my answer is actually very short. I like to keep things really simple. The best thing you can do is just be who you are. Just be true to yourself. Be authentic. Um, one of, and it's the most simplest things, but one of the reasons why people find it difficult is because we don't love and value ourselves. And what happens when we don't value ourselves is that we give our power away to other people. We think other people know what's best for us. We think, uh, so we listen to what other people tell us that we should be doing or we need to do, or we give our power away to advertisers and uh, we look at what other people are doing and so we want to do better than them and we take our cues from the outside world. What I encourage you to do is you go inward, don't go outward. Go inward, ask yourself, how can I love myself more? How can I value myself more? Listen to your own internal answers. Ask yourself, what can I do that would bring me more joy in my life? The more you get in touch with these things, the more you get to know who you are. And that's all you have to do is be who you are. Be as you as you can be. Because if you don't, then you're depriving the world of who you came here to be. That is your only purpose. And was that the reason for the, the title of your book, Dying to Be Me? Yes, absolutely. I had to die to learn that all I had to do was be me. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, it's that simple but that profound. How can people help evolve their religions for those who are still affiliated with a religion and want to do so? Okay, so... First thing I want to say is that death transcends religion because everybody dies. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, an atheist, everybody dies. So death transcends religion. Um, and if you are affiliated with a religion, that's fine. And that's great. If it brings you comfort, I don't underestimate the value of religion to some people because it brings them comfort, it brings them community, and a lot of our religious communities do a lot more than just teach religion. And if you belong to one and it works for you, it serves you, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, but I also like to say that a religion or a belief, anything that you believe in, needs to empower you. If it doesn't empower you, if it brings you fear, any belief, whether it's religious or otherwise, if your beliefs and your values and your communities are bringing you fear and not empowering you, then it's time to reevaluate them. Um, if they're making you feel small rather than, than big, if they're discouraging you rather than encouraging you, if they are suppressing who you are, if they're making you fearful to be truly who you are or to express yourself fully, you need to evaluate them. And that's what I ask you to do. 
So I have nothing against religion per se, but I'm more interested in people as individuals expressing and being unafraid to be who they are. Um, I have a problem with people who kill each other in the name of religion. I don't think anyone has the right to do that. I have a problem with people who judge others for things like whether it's being gay or anything else. Um, or judge others for being of a different religion. Those are problematic. Those are the things you need to look at. And if you do belong to a religion and you're finding that you're outgrowing your religion, um, but maybe you're afraid to leave the religious community that you belong to, I would say the way to do it is to start to show people a better way. Don't fight against religion. One of the worst things that's happening right now is religions fighting against other religions. And, and that's hardly the best way to show, uh, to show how evolved you are becoming or how you're growing. The best thing you can do is be who you are, be an inspiration, lead by example. And if you're passionate about your new growth or your new beliefs or the direction you're going, show people, teach people. Don't fight against who they are. Show them who you are. Good. Now, this next question, I've been waiting the, uh, all day to hear. Now, keep in mind, again, audience, that uh, Anita's terminal cancer was totally cured within days after she came back from her near-death experience. So there's the power of internal transformation. So what can you share with others how all this information, how realizing who we are, who walks beside us, and so on, helps us deal with life's toughest challenges now? When we realize who we are, when we know who we are, and when we come from being our authentic self, the kind of challenges that we face are actually in line with who we are. We bring them on ourselves, and we grow from these challenges. What is actually happening with a lot of people is that we're dealing with problems and challenges that are not ours because we're so busy trying to be somebody who we are not. We're trying to we're trying to follow the um, you know the advertisers that make us feel oh if you don't have this you're a nobody and so we buy stuff we can't afford we reach for things who's not really us and we try to live a life that is not ours and with a life that is not ours comes problems which are not ours which we then don't know how to cope with in actuality when you learn to love and value yourself when you allow yourself to be authentic you will still have challenges but those challenges will be of your own making. And when you overcome those challenges, it will lead to growth. And you will be, and you will see the gift in those challenges. And that's why it's so important to be who you are. And when you truly are, when you truly do express who you really are, the life that is yours will unfold before you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Now, this is one of these interviews that's hard for me to conduct because I'm just sitting here lapping this up, uh, listening. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, the last question, how can these uh, spiritual insights help us make the world a better place? When we realize that the answers lie within um, and we just, all we have to do is love and value ourselves and when we see God within ourselves, we don't have to go out and convince anyone of anything because the minute you're faced with other people, you see the same God looking out from behind their eyes. <clears throat> you don't feel the need to go and fight people to change the world. Your very presence changes them just by being around you. It changes them. No words are needed, and that's the best way, I believe, to change the world. It is not to go out and fight it but to be the change, in fact, as Gandhi said, but to really get that statement at a heart level, to be it, so that wherever you go, there you are, you take yourself. Many of us believe that we, we need to fight for our causes, but what happens is that it just makes us really angry. We get angry at our governments, at our medical systems, at the establishment, at the large corporates. We get angry, and wherever we go, we take our angry self and we create more anger and defensiveness and furor. But in actuality, I like to see more peace, and I think the only way to see more peace in the world is to spread it, to be it, to share it. 
culture, it's been well established that anger is a much lower energy than that of peace, love. Yes. And in fact, if I can just mention, um, like today we are seeing more and more cancer in the world. And one of the things I believe is because we are really focused on cancer. If you just look at how much awareness we focus on cancer, we have, we have Cancer Awareness Month. Um, we spend billions of dollars on cancer awareness campaigns. We spend billions of dollars on cancer research and on earlier and earlier detection and so on. Now, just imagine if we put that same amount of awareness and same amount of money and same amount of resources on wellness awareness and health awareness. People don't even know what it means. Even the medical people don't even know what health really means. What does it entail? What does it feel like? Imagine if people became aware of what it means to be healthy then we would see a very different world and a very different result. And the same goes for peace and so on. Instead of constantly having wars on terrorism, how about spreading peace? But I feel very strongly about the health thing. I, I, never, um, I never support cancer awareness programs, but I will always support awareness on well-being and health. Yeah, cancer care is a big, big business, but that's a whole other topic. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking your time. I know you're involved in a lot of things. I saw you on the list of speakers at a Yes, I Can conference coming up, so a way to get out there and let it shine. So, again, listeners, be sure to avail yourself of her, uh, her teaching. Very, very powerful. Anita Moore Johnny at anitamorejohnny.com. Follow her on Facebook. Get her book, Dying to Be Me. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your time and for having me.